Moving now to the third part of our job analysis lecture, I want to talk a little bit about competency modeling and its importance um, in doing job analysis and creating good flexible job descriptions. Job analysis um, for competency modeling helps us to identify the, the larger competencies, the meta skills and abilities um, that workers need for high performance. And I mean by meta skills and abilities, it's not something that is a specific skill specific to a particular job, but actually a larger competency like work ethic and conscientiousness and integrity. Those are the sorts of things that are more competency focused because when it's competency focused then it doesn't matter what job you're in if you've got a good work ethic and if you have integrity uh, and if you are a conscientious person you will be successful in really any job that you do so worker companies are trying to ensure that workers not only have the skills to do the job the actual job specific KSAs but they have these larger competencies that will make them successful um, no matter what job they're in Table 4.13 in Chapter 4 gives us some great examples of competencies that work in specific job environments. For example, adaptability. And adaptability is an important competency when there are very complex, dynamic jobs. Um, and that could be higher level employees in the organization, or it could be a job, even if you're the lowest level person, a job um, where you do a lot of R&D or it's a high-tech job where things change on a dime, right? Um, communication skills. Communication skills are important across all jobs and across all levels um, in the organization. So making sure that you have clear communication skills is a larger competency that organizations need to make sure employees have. So no matter where they are in the company, they are capable of doing the work of the company. Leadership. Leadership isn't just, in my mind, it isn't just leadership of others, but it's not your own personal self-leadership and how we create motivation and a shared purpose. Even if you're not a leader of others, you can be an informal leader of your team and you're all peers or your department where you're all peers. So leadership is about really helping to motivate people and, and, and um, get them all working in the same direction and, and you don't have to be the de facto supervisor or leader of a group to still lead them and typically this is a job that may require supervision but it also is an important factor even if you are just influencing others so again if you're a member of a team there isn't any specific leader in that team but everybody needs to motivate and excite each other and move everybody towards a goal so you can be a de facto leader in that in that team uh, emotional intelligence again the same sort of thing any job that requires you to work with others to particularly in tough emotional contexts negotiation or influencing customer service anything where you're going to you're going to have things what we call emotional labor where you're going to be asked to manage your emotions and manage and and interpret and manage the emotions of others and a great great area where you might see this is in customer service right where you're constantly dealing with um, um, customers who may be emotional or may be angry or may be irrational and you've got to figure out how to manage that. Problem solving too, again jobs that require um, uh, troubleshooting, working through a problem with a customer, you know if you've ever called your um, uh, you know cable TV rep or your cell phone rep, you know, and saying, you know, my phone doesn't work or my cable TV doesn't work and they work through the problem with you. Now, mind you, they have a standard operating procedure in front of you, but sometimes it requires them to go off script and sometimes it requires them to think outside of the box um, and to troubleshoot and to problem solve things. And so knowing how to problem solve, knowing how to think about something, how to analyze something, how to integrate information at a higher level um, is really important. Uh, creativity is also important. Coming up with novel ideas. Now we can't force people to be creative, but we can certainly do the best we can to, to put them in context where they get to exercise some creativity and give them the freedom to do that. And if for those of you that have um, been
been in management for 30, you remember the Daniel Pink video where we looked at um, how to motivate people, particularly how do we motivate people to be more creative. And really the way we do that is not to have a financial incentive for people because if nothing else that decreases creativity. But if we actually have um, intrinsic motivators within that system um, where people have more autonomy, mastery, and purpose, we will find that they will be much more creative in the bottom line. So creativity um, typically comes with all sorts of jobs, um, even even jobs that you may not think is creative, but certainly a larger job category that requires creativity are things like marketing or design or graphics or things like that where the actual purpose of the job is to be creative. But we can also help engender creativity in our employees even if they're not in a quote-unquote creative job. Um, we want our employees to come up with creative solutions to problems. Um, so that's a competency, a larger competency that we would also want to look at. The next thing we want to address is the job rewards matrix. We talked about the job requirements matrix and what goes into the job, what are the tasks, what are the um, the task groupings, um, how important is that task or that group of tasks, how much time does one typically spend on that group of tasks. So we talked about relative importance and things like that. And then the KSAs, how important those KSAs are in the big picture to be able to do a particular skill. And that then guides us, as I said, to create the, um, the selection system that we want to be able to hire the people with those KSAs. In conjunction with that, remember part of this person job match is not just about matching the requirements of the job to the KSAs, but it's also about matching the rewards that the job can offer and matching that to what will motivate or excite the employees to be able to do that job. So given that, we need to have a job rewards matrix. Now this is a good leap into advanced compensation topics and this is um, something that you will be addressing when you take Management 433 which is um, uh, the compensation and performance management. But it is also relatively important here in the context of staffing because we need to let people know what the rewards are that are associated with the job so that when they make a decision whether or not they want to um, take on the job, then we have got a reward system in place that is clear to them what they can expect would be the reward. And then our employees then can make a decision, this is a reward that I want, I'll take this job, or this is a reward I don't care about, I don't want this job. So the job rewards matrix looks at intrinsic as well as extrinsic rewards in the job. It looks at um, things like satisfaction, um, uh, autonomy, mastery, purpose, meaningful work, um, you know, good feedback. All these are good intrinsic rewards. Um, they're not financial in any way, and what they do is it really encourages you to find the motivation within yourself to achieve um, uh, in the organization. But it's also important to have extrinsic rewards. And again, if you haven't seen the video from Daniel Pink, I encourage you um, to look at the video. I'll, it's included in the Blackboard site um, just as a refresher. Um, but Daniel Pink talks about the importance of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and the importance of intrinsic rewards. But one of the, the, the key factors that he says in there, it's not that extrinsic rewards aren't important. They absolutely are. Extrinsic rewards are incredibly important. And what we need to do in order to trigger good intrinsic rewards is making sure our extrinsic rewards are good and solid. Making sure we are doing good, good pay, fair pay, good bonuses, good benefits that people want, making sure that the, the, the benefits that we're giving people or the rewards we're giving people that have monetary value um, will have a good impact on people, that it's what they want, it's what they need, it meets their financial needs, and you know we can proceed from there. And once we get the extrinsic rewards in place, then we can set that aside, and then we can work on building into the job 
the intrinsic rewards that are really important for getting the larger competencies that we care about, creativity, um, um, interpersonal competence, all of those things have to be built into the nature of the job in order for someone to be able to do that job. So when we're talking about total rewards, um, as you talk about total rewards compensation, as you get into Management 433, it is important that you recognize you need to have both intrinsic and extrinsic rewards to do that. So we create the job rewards matrix to be able to do that. And, and it's the same sort of process, right? We're going to still analyze the jobs and the rewards in that job to see what is extrinsic and what is in, intrinsic and, and, and implement that. In order to create the job rewards matrix, we have to understand what our textbook calls the employee value proposition, the EVP, which is what are the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards that the employee will receive and that they, and that they desire to be able to perform at a particular level in the, in the organization. So what's really important for us from the employer's perspective is that we need to communicate what it is that we will give to the employees that is of value. First of all, it would be the extrinsic rewards. This is what the pay and the bonus system and the, and the benefit system has to offer. But also, it's about these are the things you can expect to learn and develop while you're on the job. So these are the intrinsic motivators that this job can create. So it's important as we are involved in the recruiting process and in, the, and in the final stages of differentiating between candidates is we need to really probe to make sure that the value proposition that we're offering them is something that they want and that they value themselves. So we have to clearly communicate to them, you know, um, what it is that we're offering. And so to do that, we have to determine what is it that attracts our job candidates. We have to know this. So we have to ask them on a regular basis, what is it that you like about your job? What is it you like about the rewards? What is it, what is it that you have a value, um, that of what it gives you value while you're doing this job? Why do they enjoy their work? What what makes them excited to come into the job every day? And people will be able to answer that because most people enjoy their work. You know, there are things they don't like, but there are always things that people like. So we need to tap into that and know what they like and know what they don't like. Then we need to make sure when we're communicating this to our, um, to our uh, applicants and our job candidates, what is it that we're doing and why is it that we would be a better employer for them over other job offers they may have, whether it's your direct competition or indirect competition. So when we are creating our employee value proposition, there's three major things we need to think about. Magnitude, mix, and distinctiveness. In terms of magnitude, we want to make sure that the package has is adequate to meet our needs and maybe even exceeds what we need a little bit um, because certainly if we are a um, an organization that is um, a differentiation strata, a strategy right we we like to have a little bit extra so something that can pull people to pull the best out of them so we certainly don't want um, a, a reward system that's too large and it's going to hurt us financially but we don't want it to be too small where people will be motivated because the reward system isn't adequate. So again, going back to Daniel Pink's video, you want to make sure that we're getting the extrinsic rewards out of the way, that it meets their needs, that there's no want in there at all. And then you can go to town with all the extra stuff that will actually create the excitement and motivation in the individuals. So um, spending too much on rewards can hurt you. Not spending enough can also hurt you. Number two, we want to focus on the mix, refer, and that refers to the compensation, the composition of the reward package, meeting the preferences of your applicants and employees. And it's a mixture of, again, extrinsic and intrinsic motivators, and it's also looking at um, the mix of um, uh, rewards that we want to give to people um, and making sure that these are rewards that matter to them. If we have an older workforce, daycare is not a great reward for them, right? Um, retirement is. But if you have a younger workforce that is starting to have children, then you want to make sure you've got daycare benefits of some sort that are attached. 
Um, it's about knowing your audience, knowing what they need and what they want and, and having a flexible benefits plan or a flexible rewards package that gives people the rewards that they need or enables them to mix and match the packages that they want and that they need. Lastly is distinctiveness. And you want your reward package to be different than that of your competition or that of other employers who would be hiring your employees. So you need to make sure that you are doing some research on what kinds of rewards are being offered in your local area or based on what your competition might offer and making sure that you can position your package in a way that makes it stand out from what others are, are offering. So in our job rewards matrix, there are three basic dimensions. We want to know, people want to know how much of the reward they're going to get, um, how, it differ, how it's different across all employees, um, and then how stable or reliable that reward is. Now, if you remember going back to expectancy theory um, and motivation theories, I mean, people will only do work if they, uh, um, they know if they put forth the effort, they can perform the task. If they, and then if they perform the task, they'll get the reward. There's a probability they'll get the reward. And if the reward has valence to them, if they want the reward. So people have to believe they can do the work. They have to believe then if they do it, they'll get the reward. And they have to believe that the reward is something that they're going to want in the first place. So the stability and the reliability of that reward system is really important. So amount means making sure no matter what that they have pay and that there's a level of task variety that really triggers intrinsic motivators, that there's a differential um, in how the reward is given, that we're clear lower level employees get a certain reward, higher level employees get a different reward, or that certain rewards are the same no matter what because we're all basically the same in terms of the types of vacation time that we have or that there's a really clear system in place for how with more seniority you get more vacation time. Um, you know, ex so we need to have some consistent rewards that we know everybody's on the same playing field and we need to ha have <clears throat> excuse me, we need to have some variable rewards so people know that as they advance, as they become better workers, they can achieve better rewards. So you need a little bit of a carrot and a stick ahead, but you also need to treat people fairly by making sure that anybody with a certain amount of tenure gets a certain amount of vacation days, but with a promotion or with more advanced tenure, they get more vacation days. And again, the stability, as we talked about, um, we want to make sure that the reward has a, has a clear guidelines for when it might vary and for when it might stay the same. And you don't want to give a reward and then say, well, no, we're no longer going to give this reward because that's not fair. Um, so we want to make sure people recognize that rewards are based on what the criteria is for what the rewards are based on. So if you have a variable reward, if it's merit pay, um, what levels of performance would be expected to, to get the highest level of merit pay. If it's based on um, organizational profitability um, or business unit profitability, again, what level of reward is expected for that? So our last two slides are looking at what an actual job rewards matrix will look like. And just as we had to develop questions and ask our employees what they wanted or how important a particular reward was on a, on a scale of 1 to 10. We have to do the exact same thing with the job rewards matrix. Um, like I said, job requirements, you know, how important was a particular skill, job rewards, how important is a particular reward. So we want to have our job rewards matrix to include extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards. So this page is looking at the extrinsic rewards. It's looking at what the reward is, um, what is the amount that someone would typically get on average for this particular job, or the range within which they could expect. Um, and that's where the differential is, right? So the reward is what it, a particular manager makes right now, but the differential is sort of where it could range from lowest to highest. The stability regards, it, it, does it change based on market conditions or, or firm performance? Or is it stable? Is it a guaranteed, no matter what, this is what you're going to get? Um, does it appeal to workers, and how many workers would it necessarily appeal to? 
Um, then we go into benefits. What kind of benefits do you offer? Was there any differential? Does everybody get the same benefits? Or do you get more vacation days if you're an officer of a bank versus not an officer of a bank? Do you get um, more vacation time if you've been there over five years versus not? Um, is your reward stable or does it vary based on market conditions? And to whom might this reward um, appeal? And then performance-based pay, again, you know, answers the same questions. What is the reward? And you can say, well, on average, people get 4%, but it can range from 0 to 15% depending on how good a performance we have, how well it's documented. It may change based on the firm's performance. And basically, this will appeal to people who care about variable pay and who believe that their work efforts were going to have an impact on the bottom line of the firm. So, you know, all those things uh, come into play there. Lastly, we're getting at the intrinsic rewards, um, and as you see it in, in Table 4.14. Um, so what type, typical intrinsic rewards would you see? Promotional opportunities, um, having um, individual responsibility for doing certain tasks, having a variety of tasks to do every day. And so, again, you would assess different kinds of intrinsic rewards. You would ask your employees to assess them. Um, um, what one can expect in terms of the reward amount, um, what is the differential, what's the earliest the reward can happen or the latest, um, when can you expect to receive that reward, is there a range in within which you would receive an intrinsic reward, um, is it stable or to whom it might appeal. Um, so individual responsibility for tasks, for example, above average um, reward, and so people have an opportunity for above average responsibility on the job, that's great. The differential is really going to be based on whether um, somebody's skills and performance is low, medium, or high, and where it fits on that range. So it's fairly stable in that the reward's not going to go away, that people are always going to have different levels of responsibility, and it's going to be consistent, and it's not going to go away, you know, in, for any sp specific market reason, um, you know, or based on any sort of um, uh, whim of the management team. And to whom might the reward appeal? Well, anybody who values autonomy and responsibility in making decisions for themselves. So you can see how this all plays into understanding motivation theories, understanding autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and understanding extrinsic versus intrinsic rewards and how important these are. And these are the tools that we use then to create the value proposition that we communicate to potential workers saying not only are these the extrinsic rewards you can expect but these are the intrinsic rewards that are built into our jobs and, and our um, organization and this is what you can expect in terms of growth opportunities or challenging opportunities and stretch opportunities for yourself. So the job requirements matrix and the job rewards matrix work hand in hand to help you to design an employment uh, selection system and a communication of messages about the in, within the selection system about the jobs um, uh, that you can uh, offer to your employees. Um, as I said, also the the job rewards matrix goes into a little bit more detail. Also, when you get into the um, compensation class, management uh, four thirty three.